Our presenter, Rick, Rick Wallace, has a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from UC Santa Cruz. He worked as a staff member at Los Alamos National Laboratory for 30 years working on physics simulations. His hobbies include nature photography and astronomy education. And I'll turn it over to Rick now, and I'll continue to monitor the chat window for any questions or comments coming in. Okay, thank you, Akana. Now I'm really gonna talk about the next 10 or 15, maybe 20 years. That's the focus of my talk. Uh, if we have time at the very end, uh, I might go a little bit beyond that, but um, that's the, going to be in the main part of my talk. And I actually just added some new material in the last half an hour. So I'm not sure quite how long the talk is now. So we'll see, some news articles came out that I had to include. So uh, we have an up-to-date talk. What I will do is review Apollo and Saturn V, Soyuz, the Space Shuttle, International Space Station very quickly to uh, remind you of what those spacecraft look like so that you can compare those to the ones that we're looking forward to in the next couple of years. Uh, the Apollo moon landing program, uh, put uh, we had six Apollo missions that successfully landed on and departed from the moon between 1969 and 1972. Uh, it uh, put 12 astronauts on the surface of the moon and returned over 800 pounds of moon rocks. This is an image of the Apollo uh, command module. In, uh, if you go to the website mentioned here uh, or just search for Smithsonian uh, Apollo 11 3D, and you'll find it, uh, is actually a 3D uh, laser scan, high resolution laser scan uh, of the uh, Apollo 11 command module. And you could use your mouse to move around uh, within the, um, the area of the spacecraft. And to be able to uh, see that a little better, what I'm going to do now is uh, turn off my camera and hopefully those of you who have a small screen will have a little bit more uh, of the slide showing. This is the exterior of the Apollo 11 Columbia Command Module. It's a truncated cone. Uh, this is a mock-up at the uh, uh, Space Center in Florida, uh, showing what it would look like on the inside if you were looking down on top of the astronauts. Uh, the three astronauts were confined in the command module uh, together for uh, nearly three days during the return to the, from the moon, since uh, all the other craft had been jettisoned at that point, and it was just the uh, command module coming back. Now, the Apollo 11 launched with the Saturn V. Uh, all the Apollos did, actually. Saturn V is still the tallest and most powerful rocket uh, ever to have brought, been brought to operational status. Uh, it also has the record for the heaviest payload. Of course, uh, the Apollo 11 landed in on July 20th, 1969. This is uh, the video of Armstrong descending to the lunar surface for the first time. Uh, the astronauts placed several pieces of uh, science equipment uh, on the surface of the moon while they were there. Uh, and this is a, a shot looking back at uh, Aldrin uh, in front of the uh, lunar landing module. So the way Apollo worked, remember, was that you had the command module, which was that cone. It docked to the top of the lunar module here. And then the, uh, that combination moved all the way through from the Earth, uh, from Earth orbit uh, to the moon. Then uh, the astronauts got into the landing module, uh, landed on the moon, and then when they were ready to leave again, the top portion of this uh, takes off, uh, reconnects um, with the uh, command module, and uh, the astronauts transfer. Then this top part of the landing module is jettisoned, goes into orbit around the moon or crashes on the moon. Uh, and just the command module comes back to Earth. So uh, it turns out that same system may in fact be used uh, when we return to the moon in 2024. And I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. When the astronauts returned to the Earth, they splashed down in the ocean, had to be picked up from the water, and then they um, were confined to the mobile quarantine facility uh, for a total of 21 days. This was in the unlikely case of lunar bacterial contamination. There were any uh, lunar creatures. Uh, of course, if there had been any bugs, they would have been called lunatics. Anyway, moving on to Apollo 15, uh, that was the first um, excursion and the ones that followed Apollo 15 as well that were able to make use of the lunar roving vehicle, 
uh, which you see to the right in this picture, which allowed the astronauts to move quite a bit farther from their landing site. Fort stage. Fort. This is the Apollo 17. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. Um, 99, proceeded. Lifting Three, off the moon. Two, one. Ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your grid. Excellent. Okay, that's not doesn't seem to be working, so I'm gonna try this differently. Fort Fort stage. Stage. Fort. Engine arm is asking. Okay, I'm gonna get the pro. Ninety nine, proceeded. Three, two, one, ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your grid. That shows Excellent. the separation of the vehicle and only the top part uh, goes back. To meet up with the uh, command module. Uh, here you have good thrust. Okay, that shows you how that worked. And then this is the blue marble photo uh, taken by Apollo 17 on the way back to the Earth. Now, we didn't um, have a lot of space uh, activities then for a while. Uh, we had a few, but I'm not going to spend time on those right now. I'll go straight to the space shuttle. Uh, this is an example of a space shuttle launch. To give you again an idea Firing chain is armed. of the power of these vehicles. Sound suppression water uh, system activated. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 3, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Houston now controlling. Atlantis begins its penultimate journey to shore up the International Space Station. Atlantis now in the proper alignment for its eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Four and a half million pounds of hardware and humans taking aim on the International Outpost. Firing chain is armed. Firing okay. Um, this is the space shuttle flight deck, uh, which you might be able to see behind me when I have my camera on. Uh, and you'll notice that the Apollo 16 module was just wall-to-wall -wall switches, buttons, and levers. Uh, the space shuttle flight deck still has quite a few buttons, at least they have lights in them now, but uh, they do have nine view screens, uh, which does help um, understand the situation a little bit better. Uh, but it's mostly still uh, buttons and switches. And we will compare that to the uh, more modern spacecraft in a few minutes. The space shuttle conducted 135 missions from 1981 to 2011. And the one question that keeps arising is why was the space shuttle retired? Well, it was retired because it was no longer considered safe, cheap, and a fast turnaround. Um, you'll remember there were a, a, some you know, disastrous accidents with the space shuttle. Uh, eventually they had to basically take a good deal of it apart, disassemble it, x-ray parts, do a lot of very detailed testing, uh, then put it back together and certify that it was ready to go for the next round. Uh, that meant that the turnaround was very slow and it was very expensive. So NASA was hoping to come up with a, a, a successor to the space shuttle very quickly. It turns out that wasn't as quick as they thought it was going to be. Now, the International Space Station was uh, first started, the first component launched in 1998. The first long-term residents arrived in November of 2000, and it has been inhabited continuously for the last 20 years, and still is inhabited. Uh, let's see, there we go. I do have uh, some photos of the interior of the space station, so you can get a feel for what it looks like on the inside. Uh, lots of computers and laptops, uh, layers of things on the walls. Uh, this is the galley. There is certainly enough room inside for six astronauts to gather around uh, a dining table, but it's pretty crowded and uh, they kind of use all the space that they can find in there. Now, this is an astronaut exercising as he's strapped down to a treadmill. Weight-bearing exercise is critical to maintain muscle and bone mass in long-term weightless environments, such as, for example, not only the space station, uh, but a trip to the moon, uh, and especially Mars expeditions, as those may last for a couple of years. 
uh, the ISS astronauts stay on the station for uh, maybe three to six months, or in some cases, even 12 months, uh, partly to test the effects of long-term weightlessness on the human body. The um, cupola is the, uh, maintained its orient maintains its orientation toward the Earth uh, with four huge gyroscopes and uh, is by far the most popular place for astronauts to go when they're off duty. So that's the history. Let's move on to what is currently happening. The first thing I will talk about are commercial suborbital vehicles, basically space tourism. So some of these vehicles include Blue Origin uh, is the company, Jeff Bezos' company that has a New Shepard uh, craft that will uh, travel to a height of 114 kilometers. Now the international um, line demarcating space is at uh, 100 kilometers or 62 miles. And uh, so it will be in space. It uh, can take a crew of six. You can fly on it as a tourist for two to $300,000. Uh, and the duration of the flight is 11 minutes. I'll let you calculate the cost per minute, but it's pretty expensive. Uh, it, the system was tested extensively in 2019 and before actually, uh, but uh, the first uh, manned flight is scheduled for sometime next year, 2021. Now the spaceship company has the Spaceship 2 craft, which is uh, housed at the uh, spaceport in New Mexico. Again, going to 110 miles, and it will, uh, I mean kilometers, excuse me, um, a, a ticket on that costs $250,000. Uh, and in fact, we even uh, have one of the, the folks listening tonight, I believe has a, uh, a reserve spot on that. Uh, and the third one is the Space Neptune Balloon, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. I'll just point out that it uh, goes to an altitude of 30 kilometers, not quite the edge of space, but over three times higher than commercial flights. Uh, or almost three times higher in commercial flights. Uh, and it has a discounted ticket of only $125,000. So here's the Blue Origin New Shepard. Uh, it, it was designed basically for two things, space tourism and also NASA astronaut training. NASA has already booked some seats on it uh, for their astronauts. It has a fully reusable booster that lands back on the ground vertically, just like uh, the Falcon 9 uh, from SpaceX does. Uh, the um, capsule deploys parachutes and then uses retro rockets for a soft landing in the southwestern desert. Again, the first passengers are expected in 2021. Now, the New Mexico spaceport should become active. Uh, the flights should start with tourism, tourists in them. Uh, every time you ask, the answer is in about a year. And this has been true for the last five or more years at this point. However, they really do seem to be coming closer and closer now. And the hope is to get Richard Branson up in one of these uh, by the end of this year. And if so, they might start commercial flights in 2021 next year. Space Perspective is the name of the company that has constructed spaceship Neptune. You can see to the left, this is a um, huge hydrogen filled balloon that will make a six hour round trip to 30 kilometers and back down again, uh, where the capsule provides um, a shirt sleeve environment, uh, a refreshment bar, access to social media and the all important laboratory again, for only $125,000. Now let's look at private spacecraft companies from the perspective of uh, near Earth orbit, now, uh, or low Earth orbit. What, uh, what I mean by low Earth orbit is basically uh, flights to the International Space Station uh, orbiting the Earth. Uh, the Sierra Nevada Corporation has the Dream Chaser, which I'll show you a picture of in a few minutes. Uh, they um, did not make the cut uh, from NASA uh, for a the funding for a crewed mission uh, that is a, a human astronaut mission to the space shuttle, uh, I mean to the space station. Uh, and so they are now planning to uh, send cargo to the space station only, although they could revert to astronauts very easily since it was designed for that. The SpaceX Crew Dragon uh, is launched with a Falcon 9. It can take seven crew members up and it is 
uh, up there right now. Its first uh, launch with two astronauts was on May 30th. It's at the International Space Station now, and they plan to return sometime in August. The Boeing Starliner is also uh, planned uh, or funded for trips to the International Space Station. It launches with an Atlas V rocket, can also uh, hold seven crew. And it has a somewhat different configuration of sizes, but they're roughly comparable. And then SpaceX, with its uh, super heavy uh, launcher plus the Starship, and NASA with its Orion uh, and Space Launch System, I'll talk about later on when we talk about deep space projects. Let me just focus on the near-Earth ones first. As I said, Blue Origin canceled its uh, project for sending astronauts to the space station because it didn't get NASA funding for it. It's now concentrating on the New Shepard, which is the suborbital tourism starting flights in 2021. The New Glenn, which is a heavy lift reusable rocket, the booster comes back and lands uh, on the ground uh, vertically again. Um, and uh, it is, uh, a pretty hefty rocket and that's designed for sending cargo to the moon, for example. Uh, and it also is uh, working on a blue moon lander, uh, which would land astronauts, and we'll talk more about this uh, later on, if they are selected, they will be landing astronauts for the Artemis three moon mission in 2024 uh, on the moon surface and then back uh, launching from the surface. Now here's the Dream Chaser, it looks like a scaled down version of the uh, space shuttle. But in 2016, NASA selected SpaceX and Boeing to develop uh, the human uh, low Earth orbit uh, International Space Station resupply spacecraft. Um, NASA felt that the space plane concept was too complex to succeed on the schedule that they needed for it to fly. And so uh, Sierra Nevada is continuing development of this, uh, but NASA did select the Dream Chaser for six uh, ISS uh, resupply missions. Okay, so kind of dramatic music, but um, again, uh, the Dream Chaser has been selected for cargo missions to the International Space Station between 2021 and 2024. They'll fly six of those missions. Uh, the next one I'll talk about is the Boeing Starliner. Uh, it will be launched again by an Atlas V rocket. The Starliner uh, failed an unmanned Starliner mission in 2018 to the International Space Station. It was supposed to uh, dock with the space station, but in fact, it, uh, the trajectory was short. Uh, it did return to Earth and landed safely, um, but it did not make it all the way up to the International Space Station. Uh, there have been many um, commissions looking into what happened on that, and the analysis found initially that there were 61 software 
bugs that caused the mission to fail. And then initial, additional analysis found a few more. So they had a total of 80, 80 corrections and updates that they had to do uh, to the software. They hope to have that all ironed out and again, be flying this time all the way to the space station by 2021. This one will take astronauts to the space station. Uh, the upper part is the crew module, 16 feet um, roughly uh, in height uh, and about 15 feet in diameter. Notice the shape is very similar to the Apollo uh, module, although this is a little larger. Uh, and then the service module uh, down here has thrusters and fuel and a few other things. The interior of the Starliner is uh, much cleaner than the complex Apollo 11 command module, uh, but does still have many manual switches and dials on its control console, although the controls, instead of being throughout uh, the capsule, are now located just on the uh, dashboard here. Now it will deploy parachutes on the way back to the Earth and then airbags for a soft landing um, in the desert. Uh, then a fleet of support vehicles will race to meet the capsule to extract the astronauts and remove the capsule for refurbishment and reuse. Kind of reminds me of a scene from a Mad Max movie. Anyway, the SpaceX Crew Dragon is the next one to talk about. And the Crew Dragon is launched on top of the Falcon 9 rocket. It's a very different concept, although it's still the same conical shape. Uh, it has solar panels integrated into this cargo trunk um, service module kind of thing uh, with additional room for cargo in here as well. Uh, and then radiators to radiate excess heat uh, into space on the other side. The top part is where the astronauts would sit and then the very uh, peak of it uh, opens up to um, allow docking with the International Space Station. And in fact, I believe the next photo shows uh, the Crew Dragon donk docking with the space station. Uh, again, it launched successfully on May 30th of this year, just a month or so ago, and uh, successfully docked with the ISS on May 31st. Now, uh, in November of 2020, four astronauts uh, will take the Crew Dragon uh, from the U.S. up to the International Space Station. So that will be its next flight. Uh, but in fact, slightly earlier than that, in October, uh, the three astronauts, one from the U.S. and two from Russia, will launch from Kazakhstan on the Soyuz spacecraft. That's the spacecraft that's been uh, shuttling um, astronauts back and forth to the space uh, station since the shuttle program was shut down in 2011. So here's the Crew Dragon. This is the interior. It's a spacious, clean interior that looks more like uh, the Enterprise from Star Trek or maybe a Tesla Model 10 than a command module from Apollo uh, or the Space Shuttle. Uh, all of the controls are focused on this uh, touch screen panel uh, that uh, is in front, right in front of the astronauts and uh, can fold out of the way. Um, actually, their seats fold out of the way, but the same effect. And uh, some of you may have noticed, if you saw, this is uh, something from one of the, the live TV broadcasts, I believe, from when they went to the space shuttle um, weeks ago, I mean, to the space station weeks ago. Uh, and every minute or so, one of them would reach up and uh, touch the touch panel. And basically, they're just looking at different displays. The entire craft is completely automated and will not really require manual intervention unless there is some kind of an emergency situation. Now, the astronauts, because this is the first flight, we did want to test the manual controls, and so they did put it into a manual mode to dock to the uh, space station. Uh, but this could all be done automatically and probably will be on future flights. Now, the Crew Dragon will splash down in the ocean, kind of like the Apollo did on return. The capsule is reusable, and uh, SpaceX has two recovery ships to uh, retrieve the Dragon capsules from the ocean. Um, the Falcon 9, a booster that was used to launch it, does return, is completely reusable, and uh, I'll show you a video of that returning to the Earth. 
it lands on a recovery ship on this, uh, at sea. Uh, even in fairly high seas, uh, it seems to be working really well. They've landed dozens of these now, and they all seem to work quite well. The first few uh, were a few spectacular explosions, but after that, uh, it's all worked very smoothly. Now, uh, uh, SpaceX also has a heavier launch vehicle, and it has two solid rocket boosters uh, in addition to the main body of the rocket. And those rocket boosters also come back and land. They actually land on, on the ground uh, at a landing pad. And I'll show you what that looks like. And watch for the landing lights to play on the tail end of the right The upper right view looks like it is uh, horizontal, but it's really not. It's just the angle of the camera to fit into this on five. It's really uh, a landing vertical. Their have landing boosters landing lines have started. Side boosters landing legs have deployed. And the Falcons have landed. Wow. Always amazes me whenever I see that. Um, okay, so uh, comparing the Boeing Starliner with the SpaceX Crew Dragon uh, capsule, you can get a feel for their relative sizes. Uh, in this mock-up. Uh, I do have a table, but don't worry about all the words. I know some people like to read every uh, word on every slide, but um, I've kind of rearranged the, the talk a bit since I started this, and I'm not going to talk about all these numbers. Uh, but look at the size of these things. The Starliner uh, compared to the Crew Dragon compared to Soyuz, and Soyuz, the man, uh, the, the astronaut portion is this part right here. It's basically just barely enough for three astronauts side by side to be sitting. Um, so it's smaller than these two. Uh, and then the crew compartment of the space shuttle is just the forward compartment here. So you can get a rough idea of the relative uh, sizes of these. The, space sh the rockets themselves that launch these uh, look like this. Uh, this is the Atlas V on the left that launches the Starliner. The Falcon 9 launches the Crew Dragon. The Soyuz rocket launches the Soyuz spacecraft. And then here's the Space Shuttle uh, shuttle for size comparison to the others. To give you an idea, this Falcon 9 also uh, has a fairing when it doesn't have a space uh, man, uh, astronaut containing capsule on top. Uh, it just has a fairing that can be used to launch satellites and so on. This is a picture of that fairing. Uh, Falcon line, uh, the Falcon 9 can launch 60 Starlink satellites, each one of them about the size of a grand piano. And there's a guy that's uh, been put in there for scale. But that gives you an idea of the size of this fairing. So it can launch a pretty large payload. Now again, just to recap, this is what the Apollo 11 capsule looked like on the inside. This is what the space shuttle uh, flight deck looked like on the inside. Here we have the Boeing Starliner, uh, much more modern, clean design, uh, but still with some buttons and switches and so on on the control console. Uh, this is the interior of the SpaceX Crew Dragon, uh, very spacious inside, looks like a pretty comfortable ride. Uh, again, both of these can hold, uh, carry up to nine astronauts, the Starliner and the Crew Dragon. And this is the control console for the Crew Dragon. Um, the, the, to me, is just astounding, the difference between uh, the space shuttle and the uh, touch screen panels. Okay. Um, one last thing I'll show, and uh, we'll talk about this more in the Mars portion, but the uh, SpaceX Starship is designed mostly for deep space, that is the Moon and Mars, but it can also dock with the ISS and could be used uh, to transfer uh, huge amounts of cargo, for example, uh, back and forth, somewhat uh, a little like the, the uh, space shuttle did although it doesn't have the big car bay, cargo bay doors that the space shuttle had. And to try to give you an idea of the relative sizes of those, I'm going to stop the sharing for a moment of the slides and hopefully go back to video if I can figure out now how to turn my video on. There we go. 
Um, and so I have a few models to give you an idea in three dimensions what the sizes of these things are. First, here is the, uh, whoops, put it over here, the Starliner. Uh, this is Boeing's Starliner. And the SpaceX um, Crew Dragon, if we try to put these uh, together, um, and I can arrange them, there we go, so that the crew compartments are about the same place. You can see that the Crew Dragon is a little bit uh, taller, a little bit longer, but if you look at them in dawn, it is uh, not as large a diameter as the uh, Boeing craft. So that's a comparison of those. Now again, here's the Starliner. I'm gonna show you one other. I haven't talked about this one yet, but we'll talk about it in a few minutes. And this is NASA's version of one of these uh, craft. This is the Orion spacecraft, uh, which is planned for uh, taking astronauts to the moon and to Mars. And again, you can see that this one, is a similar shape to the Boeing craft, but it is uh, a little bit larger, a little bit, taller and a little bit larger in diameter. The last thing I wanted to show you was, if I can get this down, I'm dropping it. Um, now on a completely different scale, very different scale, this is the uh, space shuttle. Uh, you can see a little astronaut running around up here. Um, and uh, the guy in, in the front to give you some scale, sense of scale. Now the space shuttle uh, is on a different uh, scale. This model is on a different scale than the earlier ones I showed. Uh, if it were the same scale as the earlier ones, it would be about uh, what 50% larger. So uh, you know this is this is much larger than the ones previous ones I showed. But what I want to do is give you an idea of what this looks like. Uh, if I can figure out how to hold on to it, compared to um, the space, new SpaceX craft, the Starship. Here is a Starship model. I have to figure out how to hold this thing. Here is the Starship model. And you can see this is exactly the same scale as the space shuttle here. <laughs> and it is clearly much larger than uh, the space shuttle. The uh, windows up here are for passengers. These black areas would be windows. Uh, and so you can think of these as portholes in, in a ship or actually uh, large view rent windows. Uh, and that gives you an idea of the crude, uh, the part where the astronauts would uh, be involved is from here on up. And the rest of it is propulsion systems and fuel. So with that, let me go back to sharing my slides again. Um, I think this is the one I want. Yes. And we'll move forward. I'll also mention the Russian Soyuz spacecraft because it is still continuing missions to the International Space Station. Uh, it's been in con continuous service since 1967 uh, with a crew of three astronauts and uh, Roscosmos, the uh, Russian Space Agency, is partnering with a Virginia-based space tourism company, Space Adventures. The space agency, uh, Russian Space Agency, has already flown seven people, seven or eight, to the space station before 2010 uh, with the help of this company. SpaceX also has a contract for um, space tourism uh, with the same company. So we'll see what they do. Uh, way of tourism. So speaking of space tourism, here's a quick recap of the space tourism options. Uh, if you really don't want to spend very much money, you can go with Space Perspective and do the balloon ride for six hours at $125,000. Or you can go down to the spaceport in New Mexico and get a two and a half hour ride for $250,000. Blue Origin is only 11 minutes for a comparable price, uh, but it of course uh, is a real rocket experience. Now in uh, 2009, Guy uh, Lullabear, who was the, um, uh, one of the uh, co-owners of Cirque du Soleil, paid uh, Roscosmos $35 million to spend 10 days on the space station. Now, 
given current prices and other things going on. Uh, I would guess that that would cost about $50 million today. And uh, Roscosmos has said that they will restart this uh, space tourism uh, capability and they'll take a couple of tourists up next year uh, for roughly $50 million. And not only do you get to stay on the space station for a few days, but you get uh, to uh, float around in space in a spacesuit and do a spacewalk as well. We don't know what the SpaceX Crew Dragon might cost, but perhaps on the same order, 50, $55 million. Uh, they charge NASA $55 million per seat for their astronauts. But if they have a full set of four astronauts from NASA and they still have three more seats, who knows what they would charge for those. Uh, so the NASA cost per seat to the International Space Station um, was for the space shuttle, depending on how you calculate this, perhaps $64 million. Um, the Russians are charging 90 million uh, in November. SpaceX charges NASA 55 million. And Boeing is thinking about charging about 90 million uh, so that they can be competitive with the Russian spacecraft. Now let's talk about Moon and Mars. So, Blue Origin decided um, not to be involved in this low Earth orbit activity, but they do have one of the moon lander finalists, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, as well as the New Glenn uh, rocket for uh, sending cargo to the moon. Uh, the Starliner from Boeing is designed for low Earth orbit, but it's uh, roughly the same size as the other craft. Now, Orion is bigger, uh, but uh, it's, it's not that much bigger. So it's feasible that uh, Boeing could try to get into this business as well. Don't really know. SpaceX is a completely different uh, ball game completely. It can handle, um, the Starship can handle a, a crew of 100 uh, and take over a million kilograms into space. NASA is building the Orion uh, multipurpose a crew vehicle, that's what MPCV stands for, uh, the Orion vehicle specifically for the moon landing and for moving to Mars. Uh, the launch system is called the Space Launch System, SLS. It can handle a crew of four to six um, astronauts. And um, it has a number of contractors, Boeing, Rocketdyne, Northrop Grumman, uh, and a number of others. Now here's the New Glenn Deep Space Booster from Blue Origin. It is almost as big as the Saturn V and it has a completely reusable booster. This is the NASA Space Launch System, the future of US space flight and solar system exploration according to NASA. The Space Launch System is the largest US rocket in history, larger than the Saturn V and the plan is to use it for the Artemis 1 flight scheduled for 2021, again next year. Next year should be a boom year for space activities. This compares the space launch vehicles. The, uh, on the left in, with the little orange in the middle is the NASA Space Launch System. Here's the old Saturn V as a comparison. The Blue Origin New Glenn. The, U, uh, the Delta IV, which is uh, the Delta V is the upgraded version of that, um, that will be launching uh, some of these, um, the um, Boeing Starliner, for example. Uh, and then the space shuttle over here to the right to give you a scale idea of how large these others are. So let's talk about going to the moon. Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo and goddess of the moon in Greek mythology. Now she personifies our path to the moon as the name of NASA's program to return astronauts to the lunar surface by 2024, including the first woman and the next man. When they land, our American astronauts will step foot where no human has ever been before, the moon's south pole. Um, okay, we got weird stuff going on. The uh, here is the Orion spacecraft um, coupled uh, with this additional module that will be used for uh, moon travel. Now, Exploration Mission 1 is an uncrewed, um, no astronauts flight test, not, uh, that's C-R-E-W-E-D, 
fly test that will travel uh, from the Earth, past 62 miles above the moon, orbit the moon for six days, and then return um, during this three-week flight. Um, it includes two female radiation phantom mannequins to assess radiation exposure beyond the Earth. Of course, if you're near the Earth, the Earth's magnetic field shields us from a great deal of space radiation, especially uh, solar wind, charged particles uh, from, uh, emitted by the sun. Uh, that will not be the case for the moon astronauts. Let's see. This is the interior of the Orion spacecraft. Uh, it is 16 feet in diameter uh, by 11 feet high, which is two and a half times the volume of the Apollo spacecraft. The Artemis path to the moon is, again, this uh, spacecraft flight, Artemis 1, um, that was hopefully will happen around 2021 uh, without astronauts, but with just the mannequins for radiation uh, protection um, uh, measurements. Then Artemis 2, the humans will orbit the moon. And then there will be a number of Artemis support missions to build something called the Gateway Station, which is kind of like the International Space Station, but a very small version of that orbiting the moon. Then Artemis 3 will be um, four astronauts uh, to the moon, uh, perhaps by stopping off at this Gateway Station first, and then using a separate vehicle, a moon lander, to land on the moon. Uh, there is an option for them to fly out with um, Orion, uh, with the land moon lander docked, uh, or have it in lunar orbit and dock with it there, and then land on the moon, or to first go through the Gateway Station. Okay, this again shows the Orion capsule attached to its service module and propulsion stage. The service module provides a little bit more room and some extra equipment uh, for astronauts as they're going to the moon. Now the lunar orbital platform, uh, known as the Gateway Station, um, will help gain knowledge and experience necessary uh, to venture beyond the moon and into deep space. The concept is that we're most likely going to have to have something like this uh, pretty far from Earth orbit, escape Earth's gravity completely, uh, to prepare ships, refuel them, and so on, and get them ready to go into uh, a deep space mode like, for example, to Mars. It will serve as a base station for advanced lunar lander missions, both robotic and those with astronauts. Uh, and it does require the development of a reusable lunar ascent vehicle. The phase one gateway station uh, is shown here with the human landing system or a, a version of it. Uh, the Orion spacecraft docked in the back, logistics module, power and propulsion element, uh, and so on. Now some activities uh, near the lunar crater are shown in some of these uh, sketches. Uh, as I mentioned, they uh, are planning to uh, land near the South Pole. Uh, part of the reason for that is that there could be frozen water in the permanently shadowed craters of the South Pole of the Moon. They developed, uh, NASA developed a new spacesuit for this, uh, both, uh, both an extra vehicular suit, equivalent to the one that was worn on the Moon, and the Orion crew survival suit that is only worn for takeoff and landing in the Orion capsule. Uh, this little video gives you a quick idea. Let's take a look that looks at like. the spacesuits of the Artemis generation. when we go to the moon. Okay, remember that the Apollo astronauts, uh, when they put their spacesuit on, it was so heavy that they could not walk across the stage like that. And nor could they bend over. They had to kind of hop around on the lunar surface. And uh, this uh, spacesuit allows them, uh, the video goes on and shows her bending over to pick up a rock and some other things that just couldn't be done in the previous spacesuits. 
Now, NASA has requested bids for a separate human landing system, or HLS, to shuttle astronauts between the moon and the gateway station or the Orion capsule. On uh, April 30th, NASA down-selected and funded these three options shown here. A down-select next February will choose the final vehicle. Uh, Dianetics is working with Sierra Nevada Corporation. Remember that uh, um, scale-down shuttle uh, cargo vessel that you heard about earlier. Um, SpaceX has modified its Deep Space Starship uh, to kind of remove some of the fins and it would have fewer people and more cargo. It's in, but it's essentially the same as a Starship. And the Starship is the only one that is fully reusable or could function as a large moon base. The national team is led by Blue Origin but it includes Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper. This is uh, a model of the, or vision of the Blue Moon moon lander uh, being developed by Blue Origin and the national team. Uh, it's planned for an unmanned landing in 2023, and then would take the Artemis astronauts if it's selected in 2024 to the moon. The Space uh, X Starship and a proposed lunar base uh, is shown here. Note the scale of the people down on the ground here to give you an idea of how large this thing is. Uh, note the cargo elevator and the lack of upper fins in the moon landing version. Now an earlier artist rendition of that uh, looks a bit like this. The reason I like to show this is if you look at the top you see the where the lights are in the top of the spacecraft. These are all windows. There's a huge atrium at the top and then all the windows going down the side. That gives you a feel for how many astronauts you could pack into this thing. Again, it's designed to carry 100 people. Here is the SpaceX with the Super Heavy rocket. Uh, the Super Heavy rocket is used to launch the um, Starship with the uh, you know, crew or cargo or whatever it might have from the surface of the Earth. It requires quite a kick to get off the surface of the Earth. Uh, so you remember the scale of this thing, it's now doubled in size. It has a pressurized volume of 35,000 cubic feet, which is 50% larger than my three bedroom, two story house here in Los Alamos. It has space for four cabins, a common area, storage gallery, a storm shelter uh, for the Mars version, uh, and again, designed to carry up to 100 astronauts. It is uh, 80 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty, and constructed of cryo-cooled stainless steel. It is being constructed right now at the uh, site in Texas. Uh, that construction is well underway. And in fact, the new news for today is that uh, there will be a flight test of the full-scale model of the Starship uh, now scheduled for next Monday. So they have the thing put together. They're inserting the final engine over the weekend and assuming that that goes well. Uh, it won't go into orbit, but it will uh, lift off 200 feet and then come back down and have a powered landing uh, on Monday. And when it lands, it has kind of a unique uh, system for the, its landing legs, which are shown here. Notice how they kind of unfold from underneath the ship rather than the external landing legs that you saw in the earlier videos of the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy boosters. This shows uh, some fuel tanks that are actually building several of the tanks uh, in parallel simultaneously. Uh, and at this construction area, if you can see it on your screen, depending on how big your screen is, you might notice in this red circle, there's a guy on top of this. Remember, this is just the fuel tank, basically, for the rocket uh, ship. So that gives you an idea of the scale of this thing. Now the plan is for space, the SpaceX Starship to carry tourists past the moon in 2023. Their lunar flyby will be, crew, be crewed by, or have as a crew, Yasaku Mazawa, who will invite six to eight artists to travel with him around the moon in 2023. The trip will take six days. Now, if you had a, a moon or a Mars trajectory that would require refueling in a high earth orbit and uh, going to Mars and coming back requires uh, refueling on Mars in some way. The Starship will land on its tail like the Falcon 9 boosters and it will launch from 
the moon and Mars by itself without needing the extra super heavy booster. That's only for launching from the Earth. Well, of course, they want to know uh, where they're going in a uh, very precise location measurement in space. You cannot use the GPS satellites because they're orbiting the Earth. So um, people are working on an automated navigation system based on pulsar locations and timing that would allow interstellar navigation throughout the galaxy, but in particular uh, to the moon and to Mars. Uh, this instrument, uh, the small white box that's rotating around here, uh, this, by the way, is sped up 100 times. So you can see the solar panels rotating to track the sun in the background. That's not really, the sun isn't really moving that fast. Again, sped up by 100 times. But this little white box is the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer, or NICER instrument. It records X-ray photons with energies between 200 and 12,000 electron volts. Uh, and it is integrated into a project called Sextant by comparing time-stamped arrival times of the pulsar's photons the Sextant program measures the station's precise position in space. This X-ray pulsar-based navigation is sometimes referred to as XNAV. The plan is to implement this on the Gateway Lunar Station and then use it for uh, crewed missions to Mars. Now, in order to get to Mars, the Orion spacecraft would be paired with a deep space habitat. The deep space habitat docks with Orion and um, provides additional space for the crew and supplies and so on because it takes roughly six months to get to Mars, six months back, and they may be on the surface for a very long time as well. So uh, they need a little bit more room. And so it would, uh, uh, this entire craft would go to Mars, um, not just the Orion. Uh, craft itself. In fact, if um, routine trips to Mars became uh, the way of the future, then NASA is planning on a Mars transfer vehicle. It docks here with the Orion spacecraft here. Here is the multipurpose module, a utility tunnel, a laboratory module, and then a cryogenic propulsion stage uh, here. So uh, this, the Orion spacecraft will be launched and then dock in low Earth orbit with all of these other components. And then uh, this propulsion stage would provide most of the propulsion to get to Mars as quickly as possible. Well, what happens when they get to Mars? Um, Mars colonies. Well, first of all, radiation would be a serious concern uh, for any travelers to Mars. Uh, the blue uh, show uh, things like a U.S. average uh, background radiation, a CT scan, a little bit more than a year's background radiation. Um, the DOA radiation worker limit is in green. Uh, six months on the International Space Station, uh, radiation exposure is shown in uh, yellow. And then a 180-day transit to Mars and back uh, is shown in orange. And a 500-day uh, stay on Mars is shown in red. So, uh, you know, these two added together are the exposures that people would be looking at. And that's quite a bit. Now, as I mentioned, uh, here on Earth, we are protected by uh, Earth's magnetic field uh, from the uh, so solar radiation, the solar wind, uh, but that would not be the case on Mars. It does not have a magnetic field. And in fact, the uh, charged ions uh, and solar wind seems to have blown Mars's atmosphere off the planet, which is why it's dry and arid right now. So uh, the Astrorad vest is under development. It protects the most sensitive organs and stem cells. Uh, it's custom molded for each astronaut. Uh, and this is what will be tested on the radiation measurement dummy during the Orion 1 moon orbital flight. Uh, it's currently being tested in a generic form here on the International Space Station right now. There are other ways of reducing the radiation exposure to astronauts. Some of these are under development. Um, for example, meteor mining for heavy metals that could be used for shielding, uh, active shielding, electromagnetic field generation if you have enough power, uh, shielding your habitat with dirt, water, or ice caves. Uh, again, the Astro Rad Vest is under development. Um, what would a colony look like? Well, this was the plan for the Mars One Colony. It's a Dutch company planned to launch 
the colony by 2032. Over 4,000 people applied for the one-way trip to Mars before the company became bankrupt and was liquidated in 2019. So um, people are willing to do it. The Mars colony concept, uh, again, might throw dirt over the uh, living portions of the uh, colony. Uh, oh, I should mention that, well, this is a Mars Alavatube uh, colony. A lot of people are now advocating for such a colony to be built in a lava tube that will provide natural uh, radiation protection underground. Uh, you can see to the right, the common area, greenhouses, uh, a group of dormitories, a corridor leading to laboratories and so on. Uh, this was the uh, concept that was used for the miniseries produced by National Geographic in uh, conjunction with NASA uh, in a mini series called Mars. And this seems to be uh, a, a leading way of doing this at this point. Now, Mars, I mean, uh, NASA, excuse me, had a contest for potential Mars-based designs a few years ago. And these were some of the designs that people submitted. This is from Alexei Rubikin. This is from the Blackbird, Inter Blackbird Interactive. And this is probably the most um, elaborate uh, Mars-based visions. Uh, this is the... Wrocław uh, University of Science and Technology in Poland came up with this um, somewhat more conservative uh, design. And the lava hive design is probably one of the more, the most conservative that were submitted. Mars has already designed a rover. You can see this rover vehicle if you go to the um, uh, Space Center in Florida. Uh, they, it's on display there. Now, asteroid mining is an interesting concept. It turns out that there are quite a few minerals that could be mined in asteroids that are much easier to get to in asteroids than they are deep under the Earth, um, at the base of the Earth's crust or even deeper. For example, gold, silver, and platinum, nickel, iron, cobalt metals to be used in space construction. Uh, asteroids also have a surprisingly large amount of water it can be split into uh, hydrogen and oxygen for fuel as well as mined uh, for water itself. There are already 10 companies who claim to be working on technology for asteroid mining. Okay, I guess I'm going to say that um, it is now eight o'clock and that is the main portion of my talk. That covers uh, the plans for roughly the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Remember the Mars uh, mission uh, from NASA was planned to be about uh, in the 2037 timeframe now. Uh, of course, SpaceX might get there a little bit sooner if it uh, can get the Starship uh, running as uh, smoothly as planned. And we shall see about that. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, ask you if you have any questions to start typing those into the chat, if you haven't already. And Akana can start going through those and um, decide on which ones uh, to try to combine and, and, and ask me about when this is over. In the meantime, while you're doing that, I will jump out way ahead. We're talking about the future of space exploration. Well, here's the far future. And that would be true starships. That is traveling to the nearest habitable exoplanets. Um, believe it or not, there are a large number of these that have already been designed. People have been working on them since the uh, 70s. Uh, they're either called generation ships or world ships uh, designed for uh, either hundreds to a thousand years of space travel. And they might have a few hundred, a few thousand to 10,000 colonists aboard them. The generation that leaves the earth would not be the same generation that arrives. There would be an intermediate generation that only knows about space and then a final generation that gets to the destination. Now, in order to do that, uh, the propulsion systems have a ways to go uh, as well. Uh, if we traveled at the speed of Voyager, that would be uh, in order to go to Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star uh, to our sun, our solar system, four and a quarter light years away. And um, it has an Earth-like planet orbiting that star. Uh, if we were to try to go there, it would take about 80,000 years traveling at the speed that Voyager travels. Uh, Helios and Juno are the fastest space probes that we have right now. They travel at about 
250 kilometers per second. They, uh, going at that speed, it would take 18,000 years uh, to get there. Uh, if you could build a nuclear fission rocket, and now these were actually developed in the 60s and tested on the Earth, and they worked uh, actually quite well. You just use a compact nuclear reactor uh, to heat up hydrogen and blow uh, very hot uh, hydrogen gas um, through the reactor for propulsion. And uh, it would take about a thousand years for a fission rocket uh, to do this. A nuclear fusion rocket, of course, we've been working on fusion for a long time. We haven't got it to work. Uh, we has been working on laser fusion. Cindy is working on particle fusion. Princeton and others uh, are working on tokamak fusion. We have not get, uh, yet been able to get deuterium and tritium to fuse together in such a way to give us sustainable energy out that is greater than the amount of energy we put into the system. Uh, but if we could, and most scientists still think it's possible, Maybe in the next, uh, I think this one is always 50 years away, um, no matter what, when you ask. But uh, if you could do that, uh, there are ships that are designed to travel at one-tenth the speed of light. And at that speed, it would only take 36 years uh, to get to Proxima Centauri. Now, the next couple of things are a little bit farther out. Nuclear uh, fusion hydrogen ramjet, or Broussard ramjet. Uh, some of you may recall this name from... Uh, one of the components in the, um, the uh, engines of uh, Star Trek uh, Enterprise. Um, but what it does is it collects hydrogen from interstellar space and then compresses it and sends it past the nuclear fusion reactor and um, you know, pro provides propulsion. Such things might travel at 0.04 C uh, and it would take less than 100 years to get to Proxima Centauri. Antimatter engines, of course, the problem with antimatter engines is matter and antimatter immediately annihilate, and you have a hard time separating the antimatter and keeping it contained so it does not uh, annihilate with the walls of your vessel or something. Um, the record for uh, containment the last time I looked was about an hour, uh, so we're a long way from a thousand years of containment. But anyway, if you could get that to work, that would produce, uh, it produces a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, you could travel at half the speed of light and it would only take eight years to get to Proxima Centauri. Now, another thing that one could think about doing uh, is use a more conventional engine like the ones that are used by uh, Elon Musk in the uh, Starship design. They run on methane. Uh, and if you were to get to Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, there are actually methane lakes on the surface of Titan. You could uh, stop by there, refuel, uh, this is a methane engine being test fired. Uh, you could refuel and take off again very easily because it has a much lower gravity than on the Earth, so it doesn't take much energy to lift off of Titan. Here are a few concepts. Um, perhaps a micrometeorite shield on the front. Uh, it could even be made of ice, which could be used for other things later. Uh, and then rotating toruses and the speed of rotation uh, governs the amount of artificial gravity that these things uh, would supply to the colonists inside the ring. Uh, another version of that with the rotating rings to supply gravity. Here's a design that's really interesting because it has eight separate cylinders uh, with separate habitations of 500 to 1,000 people each uh, communicating with each other. Uh, and this has some redundancy against disaster. Uh, if one of these is taken out by a meteorite impact or a meteor impact, for example, uh, you might still have several more surviving. Uh, and socially, it would operate somewhat like separate villages. Now, this is the uh, Daedalus spacecraft, which was designed in the 70s. <clears throat> it was an, uh, designed as an unmanned probe. Uh, actually, if you go to Bernard Star, which is about six light years away, uh, it was designed to use inertial confinement fusion, if they could get that to work, uh, deuterium and tritium pellets uh, uh, fused by an electron beam. Uh, and uh, it would be able to generate a speed of about 12% the speed of light um, uh, and get to Bernard Star in about 50 years. Here is, this is just the engine portion of this because this is an unmanned probe compared to the Saturn V rocket. So these things are huge and that doesn't include, you know, the part that people would be in if it were um, a, a complete generation ship. So it looks like from the studies that have been done, it would take a minimum of 98 people to mitigate disaster, disease, and so on. You'd need 1,000 to 5,000 people, or maybe 500 people uh, with cryogenic embryos, sperm, and eggs, 
uh, that you could then fly out and use when you arrive. Uh, the main problem with colonization might be actually not the technology so much as the alien bacteria or viruses that might be in the local environment. Uh, and the environment itself may prove toxic to humans. Uh, remember in the War of the Worlds, the Martians were killed by the Earth bacteria. So Jeff Bezos has a proposal for uh, what are called O'Neill cylinder colonies uh, for people to live in space orbiting the Earth if necessary. Uh, and you would have these rotating cylinders. You would have several cylinders, independently rotating cylinders. The rotation rate uh, controls, again, the gravity for each cylinder. And uh, each one could be a unique habitation or lifestyle. Uh, you could even have low gravity for recreation and so on. Uh, you might have something that has a city, a high-speed transport to rural areas and farming and so on. Or you might have a European village type atmosphere, or you might have an ultra-modern city type atmosphere. So moving back to the Earth a little bit, <clears throat> I'll mention that uh, this is one of the SpaceX uh, concept for a base on either Mars or the Moon. And this looks like it might be actually achievable within the next 15 years, um, perhaps the next uh, uh, five years uh, as a start on this for the Moon, and then maybe 15 to 20 years from now on Mars. So that's it. Um, thank you for joining me, and we'll see if Akana has some questions. Yes, we do have several questions that have come in. Uh, what do you believe is the most dangerous part of traveling to Mars? If Mars 1 actually tried to go off, would they have most likely failed? The problem with Mars 1 is that they had very little money. They had very little planning, and they uh, had a very aggressive time scale. So <clears throat> uh, I think with more planning, taking a little more time and doing things incrementally, not just uh, having a company that is designed to go straight to Mars, but do what uh, NASA and SpaceX are doing. And that is first you build spacecraft that can go to low Earth orbit, then you build spacecraft that can travel to the moon. Then you build spacecraft that can um, construct a moon station, uh, an orbiting station around the moon, and then a moon base and travel back and forth to that moon base to gain experience. Once you gain that experience, then traveling to Mars uh, is not so difficult. There are social issues because you're gonna be confined with perhaps uh, as few as six or seven other people, maybe more, um, for a very, very long period of time. Again, a uh, year's round trip, uh, plus maybe 500 days on the planet before Mars and the Earth are back in the right configuration to return home again. Uh, so um, I think it's being done stepwise, that makes sense. But you have uh, to deal with these social uh, interactions, which are being investigated on the International Space Station by astronauts who are staying there for six months to a year at a time. Um, you also have to deal with this radiation problem. Uh, again, we have the best. We don't know how well they'll work. Uh, we have other potential uh, ways of mitigating some of that radiation exposure, but that is uh, an issue. Um, by having a Mars transport vehicle, like NASA is talking about, you have more room, more supplies, uh, uh, a lot of backup redundant systems that make the trip to Mars not so uh, significant or dangerous. Um, of course, it's all dangerous, but not quite as much so if planned properly. Uh, but a Mars colony requires hydroponic gardening. It requires building, constructing something out of the Mars soil and, and what you find when you get to Mars, probably finding water on Mars that you can use. And that's still an unknown. So we still have quite a few uh, um, unmanned probes or um, you know, robotic probes to go to Mars and try to do what the ones that are being launched in the next couple of years are trying to do. And that is look for things like um, hints of possible uh, life, hints of water, where it might be, is it uh, usable for astronauts and so on. Uh, on a kind of related note, we had another question. Moxie is going to cr convert CO2 to O2 on Mars lander. How do you create enough for a colony on Mars? Right. Um, one of the things that they would like to do is see if they can scale that up. Now, so that is... Uh, inherently a small scale process, but people are certainly looking at ways of scaling that up so that you can create um, oxygen from the CO2 
Um, the problem uh, is energy. In order to do that, you have to have energy. And uh, I don't know if Moxie is scalable. And there may be somebody out there on, the, on this uh, uh, video uh, that might know the answer to that. If so, perhaps they could indicate that and you could unmute them and they could say something. Um, but the issue is it takes energy. And how do you do that? Do you do it with a small nuclear reactor that you bring with you and put in place? Um, or do you have other kinds of energy concepts? But in practice, I mean, in theory, there's uh, not too much difficulty in doing that. It's, we know how to do it. It's uh, providing the energy to do it. That would be the concern. Uh, what is being planned by China, Russia, and the UAE? Okay, so uh, you may have heard that there are a number of Mars probes uh, being launched. Uh, UAE is uh, launching one uh, this year. So is China. Um, the U.S. is launching the uh, Perseverance uh, um, rover kind of uh, uh, robotic lander, uh, hopefully on July 30th. And if that's the case, it will arrive in the fall. And uh, it actually has a little helicopter attached to it uh, that will be used uh, like a drone to explore wider areas of Mars. Um, then the European Space Agency uh, has a uh, Mars system that unfortunately was delayed because of the pandemic crisis. Uh, it's now scheduled to launch in 2022. And it has a drill that will drill down six feet underground uh, to be able to sample all sorts of things much deeper than anything uh, that we've been able to do before. So it might, it, it's designed specifically to look for potential life or, or past life on Mars. And it even has uh, a hyper clean room uh, associated with it to analyze the results from that drill uh, and the samples brought up from the drill. Uh, so there are those. Uh, the others, um, you know, they don't have a, as much of a track record. Um, China has landed on the moon, on the far side of the moon, and uh, has uh, shared some data that they received uh, from their craft to do that. Um, and um, they're planning, of course, Mars expeditions as well. I am not aware of um, <clears throat> human uh, expeditions planned by other countries to Mars. There undoubtedly may be some, uh, but I personally don't happen to be aware of them. Okay, we have a question from a Lennel intern who's working on nuclear fusion, but is really interested in space travel, wondering how often does NASA collaborate with Lennel on projects? Uh, there are some collaborations, and in, uh, in fact, the Mars rovers that are up there now uh, are, um, there's a very heavy collaboration uh, between Los Alamos and um, those uh, Mars uh, rover projects. So there are collaborations. Uh, I'm not aware of a collaboration on propulsion systems, for example, which would be, you know, right along uh, that person's alley, but, um, but uh, I'm sure that such a collaboration could get started if someone had uh, ideas that appealed to NASA. Uh, so there are NASA collaborations at the laboratory and um, I might be able to look up some people who could um, put this person in touch with some of these folks who have NASA collaborations. Uh, if they would uh, um, send their email, uh, you could send it to me at uh, peaknature.org. So uh, Wallace R. I think it's Wallace R uh, at peaknature.org. And uh, I'll try to look that up. Uh, and I could try to get you in touch with some other people. Cool. What is the plan for supplying fresh food on a trip to Mars or will it all be preserved in some way? And I kind of wondered that also when you were talking about generation ships. Yeah, right, a different question. right, right. So for even a trip to Mars, uh, it's difficult to provide all of the food it, by just having dried packets or something like that. The, uh, again, a trip to Mars uh, may take as much as, uh, I mean, depending on the efficiency of the propulsion system you have available to you at the time, uh, the simple version would take two and a half years. Uh, and that's a long time. It's hard to have that much food without a resupply mission. Now, there are a couple things you can do. One thing you can do is um, have robotic probes that you send ahead of time with the, our huge cargo ships. Land these cargo ships all over the place before the astronauts arrive, and then they could make uh, their station, uh, base station out of those materials. It could include food. It could include a lot of other things. 
So that's one way of doing it. Uh, if Elon Musk gets his Starship uh, operational, uh, he can take 100 people and uh, 100 tons of stuff with him with each Starship. And if he sends several Starships, uh, that's a lot of material. Uh, so that's, that's one option is pre-position material in advance. Um, the other option would be hydroponic gardens. And there's a, a great deal of research right now uh, where people have simulated Mars soil to try to make it as much like Mars soil as, as they can based on the chemistry that we've seen from the Mars rovers. And uh, then try to grow uh, uh, food in those. Uh, there are at least uh, I had it in one of my slides uh, notes, but I forgot what it was. I think there are at least 50, 45 to 50 different uh, plants that have successfully been grown in Mars soil in simulated Mars environments. Um, the fact that there's a lot of CO2 around in Mars helps as well. Um, so uh, there are ways of doing that. The only thing you have to add to the soil is nitrogen. So you would have to take or be able to uh, distill from some portion of the Martian environment enough nitrogen to infuse uh, your soil with nitrogen. Otherwise, uh, these things grow quite well. So uh, that would be the most likely way of doing it. The soil is toxic. Yeah, the, the, Carolyn reminds me that the soil is uh, toxic. It has perchlorates in it. And that would have to be removed. But that's a chemical procedure that could be done. OK. It's all good to say that there are abundant, valuable minerals available in asteroids, et cetera. But what about the practicality of mining, metallurgy, and processing, and the facilities necessary? It will make mining on Earth look cheap. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and you know, I didn't talk about it, but these, these huge generation ships, and, and you brought that up too, would also have to have you know, gardening kind of things and soil inside them and all that um, to, to grow food. And, and they would have food. and and animals and, you know, just like you would have on, on farming agriculture here on, on Earth. Um, and the, uh, some of the estimates of the people who are designing these things are that the Earth would not even have an economy capable of building such a thing, which would have to be built in space uh, for at least two to 300 years. Uh, so those are really far off future things. Um, but asteroid mining is not so far off. Um, they, the plan is, to use the gateway station around the moon uh, for both government and private companies to investigate machinery that would be used for mining in space and also then to use the moon as a place to uh, do some of this mining to uh, try to use the machinery uh, very much like you would use it on an asteroid. The only difference is you'd have a little bit more gravity, but you could develop um, the capabilities and the technology on the moon by um, mining on the moon, not you know in an, uh, uh, an atmosphere like the Earth, but just put the equipment out there, um, you know, in the vacuum of space on the lunar lunar surface and see what kind of mining you can do and how you develop equipment to do that. Uh, I'm sure it would be developed on the moon and at the Gateway Station before they try to take this to an asteroid. Now, remember we have had space probes that have gone to asteroids, sampled asteroids even. Um, there are sample return missions. Uh, and so uh, rendezvousing with an asteroid, landing on an asteroid, getting samples from the asteroid, drilling into it a little bit, that's, not, that's already been done. Uh, the question is, can you scale it up to be commercially feasible? And as I mentioned, there are uh, at least 10 companies that I'm aware of, uh, and I actually have a list of somewhere, that um, are looking into this, developing this technology right now, and they do believe that it would be economically feasible because of the precious metals, as well as the uh, you know, iron ore and, and cadmium and those types of things for construction materials. So uh, they believe it would be profitable, actually, uh, to do that. Again, we're probably talking you know, five years from now or more. Okay, the, the Lemel intern who asked the question about collaboration with NASA asks if you could paste your email in the chat. Yeah, I can, catch. yeah, yeah, I can do that. Why don't I work on that while you're coming up with the next question? Okay, we're actually running out of questions, but I had one um, which is actually only peripherally related. Uh, I don't think I can actually afford even the cheap $150,000 balloon launch. 
but I'd love to drive down south to watch a launch because um, I've never seen a rocket launch. Do you think we'll have a lot of good opportunities to watch launches from southern New Mexico? Well, um, I don't remember where um, Blue Origin is planning to launch from. They are, uh, I think, perhaps in California, but I'm not sure. Uh, maybe someone else on the on this uh, video conference knows that. Um, Steve might know that. Uh, the one, the way the one works in at the spaceport in southern New Mexico, is that they have a very large airplane, and they strap the the um, space plane, if you will, onto the back of this um, other the carrier craft. Uh, it then goes up uh, to a fairly high altitude, as high as high as the plane can can fly. And then it launches the spacecraft, which then continues on up to the edge of space. So uh, all you would see from the spaceport in southern New Mexico is uh, a very large plane taking off down the runway. Uh, and then you would eventually see, uh, two and a half hours later, the space plane come back and land. Uh, so that's perhaps not as exciting as a rocket launch. So probably what you need to do is find out where Blue Origin is planning uh, to launch its um, New Shepard from, and I would suggest just doing a Google search on that. Just say, you know, in Google, where is um, Blue Shepard going to be launched from, and see how close that is to you. Okay, and Steve Becker said in the chat that they're launching from Texas. So, so they they is who? Oh well, actually, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm guessing that's Blue Origin, but I'm not sure. Yeah, probably. And that's actually all the questions we have in chat, unless anybody has any more. Um, I don't see any more coming in. So, um, Rick, thank you so much for sharing with us.